I mean, it used to be that you could expect car salesmen and politicians not to tell the truth. But now it seems everybody's doing it or not doing it, you know, not telling the truth. We know lately our family has been watching the show Northwest Law which, by the way, is a reality TV series that follows Washington Department Fish and Wildlife, men and women around as they do their job, and some right here in our own neck of the woods. And so whether it's removing animals such as bears or coyotes from the human population, or catching people fishing or Hunting illegally, the thing is most of the people caught doing something wrong try to lie their way out of trouble. As you watch this show, you see this over and over and over again. Like I thought the limit on fish was this, or the size of the crabs were, were such. Or I didn't know baiting bears was illegal. And yet the fishing game, men or women, always, almost always, know when they are being lied to. This is because either they have witnessed the person or persons engaged in the illegal activity, like before they go up and talk to them, like having two poles in the water, Or they caught these guys, got done with their raft trip, and they started throwing all their trash out in the river and in the bushes as they're watching them. Or their story just doesn't pan out like it's not at all credible. Thus they are constantly saying to the suspects, just tell me the truth, or please don't lie to me, or if you had told me the truth, Right away, you would not be getting in so much trouble. If you would have just started out telling the truth, I might have let you go with a warning. You know, years ago, when I was pastoring in Oregon, we had these foreign exchange kids coming to the school there. And a particular year, we had a German kid that lived near Berlin, and another kid that was from Switzerland. And they were just in love with fly fishing. And I was doing a little fly fishing at that time. And so they decided after watching uh, River Runs Through It that they wanted to go fly fishing in Montana. So we were in eastern Oregon. And so before they left, had to go back home in May. Uh, I said, let's, let's, we'll take a trip, we'll take a trip. And we all put in, I think, $150, and we drove to Boise. We rented a, a, almost a brand new Subaru, had very few miles on it. We drove up along the Salmon River in Idaho, uh, slept uh, one night on the way up, and then the next morning went to Missoula, got fl- fishing licenses, and proceeded to fish the Blackfoot. The only problem with the, that part of it was uh, it, it was in May and, and it was just really dirty. The, the river was just, it wasn't fly fishing river. It was, the flies couldn't see the fit or the fish couldn't see the flies. And so after a, a, a wasting a, quite a long time doing that, we went back into Missoula, talked to a, one of the guys there and said, you know, you should try the Rock Springs River, which goes north and south right out of Missoula up uh, the highway there. And so that was a beautiful river and you know, I just remember being in, in water like this deep and, and fly fishing and the Swiss kid across the river and the German kid up the river. And so we're fishing. We're having a great time. It's sunny. It's beautiful. Uh, I think we caught a couple fish there, fly fishing. And, um, and then looked up on the road. A, a road goes all along the river all the way up. We didn't take it all the way up, but um, somebody was up there and, and kind of yelling at us, waving at us to come on up here. So we, we had to walk up there, all of us, get out of the river and he wanted to see our licenses, fishing license. But we had them. So we didn't have to say anything. We were honest. Here they are. Some were a little wet, but uh, we all had them. So 
that was really cool. It's, it's nice when you are doing things the right way, right? <laughs> but it's, it's just in this, when you watch this show, it's just people are constantly lying about what they're doing or what they're not doing and why they're doing it. So people continue to lie. Well, friends, this is some of what we will be caught up in today, not necessarily as it relates to fishing and hunting, but in all of life life as it relates to the simple and straightforward telling of the truth. So this morning, we continue on in our sermon series, Salt and Light, based on the Sermon on the Mount, whereby Jesus teaches on life in the kingdom and how it operates on a more radical level. And thus, the theme and need for greater righteousness continues. Our sermon title being, Os Ousted. Os Ousted. Say that three times fast. (laughs) So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Everybody there? Okay, our first point, let me give you that real quick here. You notice I I did the bulletin this week. Uh, (laughs) My daughter came over to me in the foyer and said, Dad, did you do the bulletin? (laughs) How'd you know? My other daughter's in Hawaii, so that's what you get. (laughs) Big, bold outline. First point is the summary stated, the summary stated. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, let's read it. Again, Jesus teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, preaching. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So people, the word again, again leads into the next subject and a new theme, a new theme. And a a bold assertion by Jesus of the way God intends things to be. God intends things to be. But first, the way it was, what was said, and what was heard, you shall not swear falsely. You shall not swear falsely. Well, guys, what the people have heard is not given as a direct Old Testament quotation necessarily, but as a summary statement of certain passages of Old Testament Scripture. But before we look at some of those, we need to define a couple of terms. First, oaths. O-A-T-H-S. Guys, oaths are declarations or statements with an appeal to God or a superhuman being Like, maybe your mother, my mother's grave, <laughs> superhuman being, or to some sacred object to undergird a statement or a promise to confirm what was said. That's a pretty good definition of the word oath, what an oath is. Secondly, vows. Vows are solemn promises to God of an action to be performed. And we know that probably when we think about vows, we think about weddings and making a vow before God and before those that come to our wedding. And that goes along with the sermon last week of that's a relationship that I'm vowing to be part of for richer, for poorer, or da, 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 da. all that. So there's a vow. And really it's, it's a, a promise to God that you maintain that relationship, that you sustain that relationship until death do you part. Well, so guys, the Mosaic law forbade irreverent oaths, the light use of the Lord's name, and broken vows. By the way, you shall not swear falsely does not mean to curse or use bad words. 
Whenever we say the word swear, I think that's what kids would often think, just so you know. But instead, don't perjure yourself or, or break an oath or vow. So let's go to the word, the Old Testament. Let's begin in Leviticus. Let's see um, some of these passages. Sometimes I get caught up in learning or, you know, when I was doing Sparkies, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. You know, I, I, when I was working on the sermon, putting these passages together, I had them, I had them mixed up. And then I would move uh, one of the passages around. I look at it, I go, that's still not right. I go, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Okay, let's get them in order. Don't want to start here, move there, go back and then forward. So did I say uh, chapter 6? Leviticus chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 1. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord by deceiving his neighbor in a matter of deposit or security or through robbery or if he has oppressed his neighbor or has found something lost and lied about it, swearing falsely in any of all the things that people do and sin thereby. If he has sinned and has realized his guilt and re- will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. So you don't do that. You don't swear falsely. Uh which he has sworn falsely. Uh, So let's go to chapter 19. And we'll just look at one verse. uh, Verse 12. The Bible says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So let's move forward. Hopefully I got this in the right order to Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. And beginning in verse 1. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel saying, This is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Okay, then let's go to Deuteronomy. It follows Numbers. Deuteronomy chapter 23. See how easy this is if you have them in the right order? You just keep moving. Verse 21, Deuteronomy 23, 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. And then let's look at one more in the Psalms. So move quite a ways forward. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. And we'll just read beginning in verse 1. The King of glory, a Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is a generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Well, so again, you shall not swear falsely a summary statement or the gist of what was said to those of old and what the Old Testament declared. 
Speaking of both oaths and vows, to be taken seriously. Permitted and to be taken seriously. So again, we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. And you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, we just read all that, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. Just this is the way in which Scripture was understood. You don't swear falsely. Everybody knows you don't swear falsely. You don't make false vows. Everybody knows that. This is what the scripture said. This is what your your mom told you. If you make an oath, if you make a vow, especially in invoking God's name, you better keep it. You better keep it. Thus, do not break your word, but do it. Fulfill it. Be truthful. Be truthful. Again, that's the first thing when those guys catch somebody. I mean, they they ought to just say, I mean, some of them do say that. Now, just be truthful with me before you say anything, before you open your mouth, be truthful. And then they still lie. And the guy's been up there, you know, watching them for 30 minutes. He knows exactly what they've been doing. One guy was catching salmon off the, or off the uh, bridge. He was hooking them. I don't know when you can do that or when you can't do that, but he did it. Just running his line across and hooked one. He hit it under the bench there. And the guy's watching all this. So you don't come down, have you caught any? No. You sure you haven't caught any? No. You sure there isn't one under the bench over here? <laughs> oh, that one. That's not mine. That's not mine. I, I sat down to fish and it was already there. <laughs> well, isn't that amazing? I got one right here. I don't even have to throw a line in. People in a good deal of Judaism, oaths evidently played a large part in life. So we don't necessarily do that today. We don't, probably don't do that at all, really. Oaths and vows and all this. But it, it played a large part in life. In fact, the Misnah, a collection of the Jewish oral traditions, has a complete essay on oaths, dividing them into classes. So different kinds of oaths. This kind, this kind, this kind. Even giving examples of valid and invalid oaths. So this one's okay, but this one's not okay to say. You can use this one, but don't use that one. But they had the whole list. Well, friends, clearly in Jesus' day, people seem very ready to swear oaths and to make vows. Again, it was like almost a normal part of conversation. Their speech and promises undergirded and supposedly confirmed by such means. Now, thinking about our day, my own day, I mean, the only thing I can really remember is, um, you know, swearing on my mother's grave or or some saying like that. Do you have any other ones you can think of that were common? That's the only one I can think of. What? Uh, Okay, there's one. (laughs) There's one. Okay, well, let's go to our second point, the swearing scrutinize, the swearing scrutinize. So, verse 34, so Jesus, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn, verse 34, but I say to you. But I say to you. So again, here comes the, the, the theme of greater righteousness. 
the theme of greater righteousness and how the kingdom operates on a more radical level. This is what was done in the, in the days of old. This is what you heard in the days of old. But I say to you, Jesus, do not take an oath at all. Guys, Jesus authoritatively declares that it would be best to avoid them altogether. And he says this emphatically in the strongest terms. But you say, why? Why? What's wrong with that? Well, because there should never be the need for one at all. At all. That's why. And that's the point. Why do you have to undergird your, 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 your statement, your, your declaration? Why do you have to undergird it with something? Why can't it just be your word? I mean, while such oaths were at first designed to encourage truthfulness, they instead had become occasions for clever lies and dishonest deceit. It's like a lot of things, right? Start out, it's, it, there's a good reason for it, maybe. But everyone then tries to twist it around, turn it around. We were talking about that in parenting class. You know, you try to, you know, give your kids incentives for doing the right thing, you know, and what do they do? They want you to be there when they do it. Mom, mom, guess what? I just shared a toy with... You know, my sister. And then mom goes in the laundry room. Give me that toy back. Mom. <laughs> they always figure out how, to, how to, to take everything that we try to use for good and they turn it around and they make it so they can get rewarded or whatever uh, without having to really do it. And this is almost one of those cases. Like, for instance, what you swear by now determine whether it was more or less binding and holding the person to the truth. By what you, what you swear by, what it, what it was, what you swear by, made it more binding or not so binding. Of course, swearing by God, more binding, and under other things as less binding. For example, the Jews held that unless the name of God was specifically mentioned, the oath was not binding at all. You didn't put God's name in it. Thus, there were lengthy discussions about when an oath is or is not binding, like we said with the example, this was invalid, this was valid. And people would sometimes swear by a certain object and later claim that they were not bound by that oath because God was not mentioned. I never mentioned God's name. You never said I had to take the trash all the way out to the dumpster. Again, we just, we, you know, this is where it goes. Did I actually say God in my oath? Did we actually mention God in my vow? So then it became what we might call a racket of skirting the truth of not being accountable for such inconsistencies, a huge and evasive loophole. Again, they, you know, they weren't recording everything back there, or they weren't texting, so it just, you, you heard me wrong. I, didn't, I never said, I never used the word God in it. I never used his name. So again, this, by later claiming that no, you were not bound by that particular oath because God's name was not invoked. And of course, Jesus rejects such dishonesty, such disingenuousness. In fact, Jesus illustrates such deceit by a series of examples of specific oaths which are all inappropriate, what are nothing more than substitutes for the actual name of God. So then he says, Back to 34, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, 
for it is the throne of God. Guys, some rabbinic authorities viewed oaths by heaven as not binding. God's name wasn't mentioned. I swear by heaven, it's okay. That's invalid. Yet Jesus states, it is the throne of God. So then substituting heaven for God does not, in fact, avoid a reference to God. Jesus says it does. It does. It is the throne of God. Which means it doesn't cut the mustard. Why? Because God reigns in heaven. Verse 34, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Guys, and again, swearing by earth does not avoid the link with God. For according to Jesus, the earth is the footstool of God's feet. In fact, you see that in Scripture in the Old Testament. Which means it too doesn't cut the mustard either, but then neither does or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So there you have it. So whether by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem, God is present in all of his creation. All are inseparably linked with God as his dwelling and possession. None of them less binding than swearing by God, according to Jesus. Truly, God is sovereign over all three. All belong to him. Verse 36. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. You guys ever swear by your head? Well, to swear by your one's head meant that the swearer would give his life if he were not speaking the truth. I swear by my head that I'm telling the truth. However, Jesus declares one cannot swear by his head because he or she has no power over it. Well, that doesn't work either. You see, even one's head, which might be thought to be uniquely under an individual's control, it's my head, I have control over it, I have power over it, so if I want to swear by it, I can swear by it. That person has no power over it. One's head has divinely predetermined features such as his or her coloring. It's what you're born with. And no temporary dyeing is not in view here. Well, I can dye my hair. <laughs> Used to be blonde, now it's black. I tried dyeing my hair for a little bit. It doesn't work very good. <laughs> my dad used to do it all the time. You just, you just like, what color is his hair? Kind of reddish, blondish, darkish. It just didn't look like any real color. <laughs> now, you ladies can do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. It looks great. All you ladies that do it. But don't say, well, I have power over my head. I can dye it any color I want. It'll still come back to the original, won't it? No matter what, it starts growing out. So, just so you know. So no one is able to change the color of even one hair, which, by the way, is a very small part of the body. Thus you and I have no power, not even over our own heads. It always grows back. No, but it is God, our creator, not us, who determines the color of our hair. And I'm really, I'm amazed sometimes, you know, um, just the hair color of my, my daughters. You know, I think they get a little bit of, like, I, I do have, maybe, have, have, I have had in my life a little red in my hair. And some of my girls, Macy has beautiful hair color, just blonde and reddish. And 
I mean, I just sometimes I see her, her back of her head in the sun. It's just like, wow, God, that is God. That is all of God. You can't dye your hair to look like that. It's just beautiful. Uh, Courtney has beautiful hair. Reagan got stuck as the only brunette. <laughs> she got her hair from my mom. Um, but she just, she just dyed her hair. But that doesn't count. Don't listen to that. You still can't change it. <laughs> She's not here, so I can say that. And Delaney, I think, has the, the reddish, blondish, all that different color. So again, why would anyone think that they could possibly swear oaths by their head? By their head. Since even the hairs of the head, like heaven, earth, and Jerusalem, are all under God's sway and ownership. But now our third point. Last point being the simple solution. The simple solution. I'm not talking about hair dye as a solution. The simple solution. Verse 37. Jesus, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Comes from evil. So saints, now we come to the theme of greater righteousness. And again, Jesus, you have heard, you shall not swear falsely, but I say to you, do not take an oath at all. Let what you say be simply yes or no. So again, Jesus comes on the scene. We read what it said in the Old Testament, but he has an authoritative word for us and greater righteousness. And, and greater righteousness in life in the kingdom. You don't need oaths. You don't need to swear. You don't need to, to make vows. Now, yes, sometimes our government has us do those things. And we should do them. But we're talking everyday life, everyday conversation. We, we don't need to take it to an extreme and say, well, I can't, you know, be on a, a jury. I can't do this. I can't do that because the Bible prohibits that, forbids that. Now we're talking about everyday life in the kingdom. So a plain yes or no is all you need to say. All you should say, nothing more, nothing less. I mean, your word should be so reliable that nothing more than a three-letter word or possibly a two-letter word is needed. That's it. No more. Yes or no? Yes or no? Disciples of Jesus being those who are characterized by integrity. Like, you can trust what he says. If he says he's going to do it, he'll do it. If he said yes, that means yes. And by honesty. Again, an oath then not necessary for disciples of Jesus. No need then for undergirding what statement and our promises we make. So they're probably not going to believe me, so I'll just undergird it with uh, cross my heart, hope to die, or I'm, I'm saying this, you know, on my mother's grave, I would never lie to you. Or any of that. Simply yes or no. Jesus, anything more than this comes from evil. So any elaboration of a simple affirmation or denial comes from evil. It originates in evil or comes from the devil. Over such oaths and vows betray our failure to live up to God's standard of truthfulness. Don't need to add to it. Yes or no? Just tell me yes or no. And really the essential righteousness of kingdom living. Where we can trust each other. And therefore a simple yes or no is a practice of uncomplicated truthfulness. 
I mean, there, there was a, a few times where the, the fish and game guy would go down there and say, uh, did you do this? And they said, yes, I did it. And they just said, wow, wow, thanks for being truthful with me. And they would get off with, with, with a less of a penalty because they weren't lying. They just told them the truth. Truthfulness, the solution for what our God desires. Honesty, truthfulness. Well, friends, let's hear from our good friend Charles Spurgeon, who once said regarding this particular passage of Scripture, false swearing was forbidden of old, but every kind of swearing is forbidden now by the word of our Lord Jesus. There is no evading the plain sense of this passage that every sort of oath however solemn or true, is forbidden to a follower of Jesus. He says, all swearing is set aside that the simple word of affirmation or denial, calmly repeated, may remain as a sufficient bond of truth. He says, a bad man cannot be believed on his oath. And a good man speaks the truth without an oath. However great the pressure put upon them, Christians should abide by the plain and unmistakable command of their Lord and King. So guys, the heart of the issue is telling the truth. As parents, wouldn't that be great? You go into the room and say, okay, you know, who did what? And they say, I did it. (laughs) You know, right away, I did it. Yes, I did it. I didn't do it. No, he did it. I did it. Let me lay it out for you. This is what happened. (coughs) They were turned around, and I grabbed the toy in. (laughs) (coughs) And you would think the Pharisees would know this, would practice this, but au contraire, the Pharisees. Go to Matthew chapter 23. See, the Pharisees were the worst at taking these oaths and vows to the extreme. So Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 16, Jesus, woe to you blind guides who say, say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. So here's the distinctions. The gold of the temple. Then you then you could be held accountable. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? See, he was just he was. Tearing them apart. He was tearing them down. So whatever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. Whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. Whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. People, like he did in chapter 5, Jesus laments the distinctions being made. Like gold and gifts and temples and altars. Of course, such distinctions encourage evasive oaths and ultimately deceit and lying. The Pharisees Pharisees played that game perfectly. They knew the exact words to say, what was valid and what was invalid. And so how silly such legal dishonesty can become. Well, I didn't swear by my mother's grave. Listen, back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus cuts through these distinctions and complexities and discourages the whole practice and the importance of, of simple truthfulness.
you know, some of the guys that would, you know, shoot, shoot a, a deer accidentally, the wrong deer, whatever, didn't have horns, whatever, they'd call it in right away. I'm not a hunter, so I, I don't know what's going on, but they'd call it in and say, hey, I shot, da, da, and they'd come out, and they'd still kind of investigate to see if this guy was really telling the truth. I mean, anybody that calls it in, you got to probably think, okay, he's telling the truth. He, he calls right away, says, hey, I shot something accidentally. They still take his license. Do you know that? They still you forfeit your license if you shoot an animal that's not in season. What is it called? Not <laughs> doesn't have enough spikes. Um, and then they send it to uh, the court, and they decide what, what other. You don't get to hunt the rest of the season, though. So I, I, do, I do, do know that. So, um, So again, Jesus cuts through all the different distinctions, all the deceit, all the dishonesty with the importance of just simply tell the truth. It just comes down to that. That's where the rubber meets the road. Did you do it or did you not do it? Is it yes or is it no? So whether washing a fish and wildlife or just your common Joe no one should have to constantly say to us, those of us who live in the kingdom, can you just tell me the truth? Can you just tell me the truth or, or please don't lie to me? Please just, just don't lie to me. Or if, if you had told me the truth right away, things would have gone better for you. No, but it is important that you and I can, you and I say, can be relied upon always. She's telling the truth. She's telling the truth. The truth is coming out of their mouth. Therefore, we should never have to back up our statements with oaths, with additional statements, with some extra clever undergirding. Why? Because no such thing is necessary for the truthful person. I mean, it's never necessary for kingdom people to swear an oath before we utter the truth. Always knowing that God is in all of life and every statement is made ultimately before him, before God. God is listening to us. God's, God already saw what we did. God knows all things. Everything we say is before him. Thus, as his disciples, you and I are expected to tell the truth at all times and to everybody, no matter who they are. The truth and, and nothing but the truth. Also knowing that according to Jesus and the, and the theme of greater righteousness, and the kingdom operated on a more radical level of essential righteousness. From now on, and really from Jesus' day forward, oaths are ousted. Oaths are ousted. No need for them. No need for vows. No need for swearing. Just tell the truth. Just put it out there. Yes or no.